In Aswan we took a ride with Captain Ashraf's felucca on the Nile. The next day our vehicles were loaded onto the ferry across Lake Nasa. On the passenger ferry we passed Abu Simbel and finally reached Wadi Halfa in Sudan. Through the desert we came to the banks of the Nile where we drank tea with Sudanese before we drove towards Dongla. In the early hours of the morning we set off towards Dongola. We again take the gravel road that runs along the Nile to see the pretty villages. The track is pretty good, quite soft because the ground is sandy. In addition, the route was held recently repaired. Dirt roads quite often need repairs for the weather like wind or rain in the south, which damages the roads often heavily. If a vehicle is stuck, it leaves a hole in which other cars stuck again. Thus, a dirt road after a short time gets into a roller coaster road that must be repaired from time to time with heavy machinery. Signposts are missing and it is often difficult to find your way. As long as we drive through towns it is relatively easy. Outside villages branch different tracks and we are often unsure which one to take. The navigation system helps, it shows the direction. Since the traffic volume is low and mainly consists of local traffic, signs are not necessary. Anyway, the locals know the way and foreigners come here rarely. After some time we are back on tarmac. We need to cross the bridge to the other bank of the Nile to reach Dongola. The bridge is only a few years old, earlier here was a ferry across the Nile. Travelers tell us that in 2005 all the way from Wadi Halfa to Dongola was difficult dirt road and that the tarmac is only a few years old and the bridge as well. After days of driving on gravel, we are happy again to be on tarmac. Although, the dirt road leads through the villages and you can see just interesting things. For those who are in a hurry, the tarmac route is the faster alternative that leads through the desert through uninhabited area. Shortly after the bridge we reach the entrance road to Dongola. Urban public transport is done by so-called tak-tak, which are three-wheeled bubble cars to the sides open with two stroke engine. An airy kind of taxi and quite pleasant in the desert heat. The ride must be negotiated in advance but the prices are very reasonable. We park our vehicles on the roadside and make our way to shop. Dongola is the capital of the province of North Sudan, an area that measures 600 by 600 kilometers. It is also the capital of the Nubians. The city lives on agriculture. Well-irrigated fields along the Nile bring crops, fruits and vegetables on the market of the city. Dates also play a big role. They are harvested during September and October. Before shopping we need to strengthen ourselves and find a roadside restaurant on the main road. The food is delicious. There is falafel, bitter bread and fried fish, probably from the Nile. I do not even want to know it as precisely, as it should be Bilhasia water. Good appetite, anyway. We enjoy our meal. For drinking a metal container with water is put on the table as usual. Perhaps Nile water as well, but now it doesn't matter. We have already eaten the fish.
The following shopping trip becomes quite funny. We have fun with the traders, of course we take pictures, and the dealers themselves pull out the camera and take pictures of us. We leave Dongola South and find an idyllic place at the Nile for the following night. Next morning we continue along the Nile. We want to the pyramids of Karima. We do not take, however, the route through the desert from Dongola, but travel on along the Nile. Although the villages along the Nile are very small, each has a mosque and sometimes quite large. Sudan is 70% Muslim, Sunnis in particular. Islam came to Sudan as the Arabs expanded their spheres of influence after the death of Muhammad in 7th century. Here in the main settlement area of the Nubians, the Islamization happened 600 years after the death of the Prophet because the Nubians were originally Christians. We stop in a village to take a closer look at the houses around us. Here is a brick house out of clay. There is always a wall decorated with beautiful entrance gate. The houses as well as the walls are painted, often whitewashed, sometimes decorated with patterns. Striking is that no people are on the street, but not surprising, because at noon it has well over 40 degrees in the shade and so the people spend their time in the cool courtyards of their buildings and properties. A special feature is the small brick water or well houses that can be found in front of many houses. There are always water chucks inside ready, which are also available to the passing stranger. Cemeteries are always just outside the settlement. The graves are marked only with a stone. Slogans such as name or date of death are missing.
The Islamization process was a slow one, since the Arabs held on to their nomadic traditions and originally had no interest to Islamize other areas. Islam was brought in the Sudan by some holy men. Only in the 16th century there was a kind of Islamization established by the Funj Kingdom. The Funj were Muslim rulers which brought stability and attracted missionaries from Cairo and Baghdad. Among them were the Sufis, a new group which also play an increasingly important role in the Sudan. Reminded by the green fields of vegetables, we want to shop for dinner. We need eggs and vegetables that we buy in a small shop in a village. The shop offers the bare essentials. We get eggs and vegetables. As usual, communication is difficult in remote areas. Whether here a stranger has ever stopped once is uncertain. The men are friendly, but confused with such frequent occurrence of women. Camel herds are a daily appearance in the Sudan. A herd crosses the road. We must wait. Camels have right of way. One is well advised to let pass animals, no matter which, because they are not used to traffic and cannot assess the risk of a vehicle. The gravel ends here and we have to continue on tarmac because we want to get to Karima before sunset. On the tarmac we are progressing quickly. There are 120 kilometers to Karima left. Along the way, again and again, slender minarets rise from the plain. This is unusual and fascinates us. Not only the form and method of construction is unusual, but also the paint. Shortly before Karima, we turn off the main road and then along the Nile in search of an overnight stay. This time it is difficult because this bank is very densely populated. We must still do shopping in the village shop. Alexandra and Pine have not got everything. A quick stop and wait, the ladies go shopping. During the waiting time, I observe the village life. and cannot find a suitable campsite for the night, and it's getting late. There are days while traveling when nothing works out right, and usually something happens. Today is one of those days. We must continue to Karima. In the evening light we pass Jebel Barkal, the sacred mountain, and can also take a look at the pyramids. We want to visit tomorrow. But now we turn off in half dark into the desert. I follow Bodo's truck and the inevitable happens. We get stuck in the sand and have to liberate us in the dark yet. Only next morning we can see how badly we were stuck. In the pitch dark we had to shovel both cars free and release air, at least to get on solid ground.
Now we are left with half-filled tires. It doesn't matter to Tara. She seeks shade because it's pretty hot early in the morning. Now it's time to fill air in the tires because we will drive on tarmac. Our mini compressor is thanks to the care of my wife. Originally we did not want to buy any because we were traveling in a group where there were large powerful compressors. But my wife saw this little thing and insisted on buying it. I was skeptical, but now we are glad we have it for it is often being used and makes us well even in the depths of Africa we will need it often, not only in the desert. And surprisingly, it works quite well too, for 30 euros a bargain. Bodo is also filling his tires. The truck has air brakes and it automatically has a compressor on board. After the tires are warmed up, I check again and correct the pressure bar to the required 4.5. In a short time we are at the pyramids. It is a site of about 20 pyramids on the west side of the Jebel Barkel, the holy mountain. They are built differently than the pyramids in Egypt. They are built much smaller and steeper. They are clad with sandstone. It is a large site which consists of the pyramids and some temples, but from the temples hardly anything is left. Nevertheless, the whole area is shrouded in a mystic atmosphere. A few kilometers further, we visit the Royal Cemetery at El Kuru, a World Heritage Site. We must find the supervisor that unlocks the graves. The graves have no light, so we help ourselves with our torch. Great wall paintings come to light. We are impressed by the good state of preservation and the mystical mood of these graves.
From Karima we head towards Atbara. We need to traverse Bayuda Desert. This is not a big challenge because it is tarmac to Atbara. However, it is very hot, even the wind does not cool. The Bayuda Desert is a part of the Nubian Desert and lies in a bow formed by the Nile. In the south it gradually goes over into a sparsely vegetated landscape which extends to Khartoum. It consists predominantly of a mixture of sand and stones and is interrupted by occasional long covered ridges. In the wadis grow woody scrubs, low trees and the bushy acacia. We have a break because the heat is tremendous. Imposing are the ridges that extend through the endless desert. Occasionally bushy acacia come out from the sand. One wonders where this bush gets the water from. The settlement is very sparse. Mostly nomads with their camels live here. At our resting place, a nomad passes with his animals in the distance. We wave. The greeting is answered. Then he moves on, probably to Atbara on the market. Perhaps he wishes to sell camels. Because of the great heat, we decide to finish early today and find a good place for the night. We use the afternoon to relax and hide in the shadows of our vehicles. On a new bridge you cross the Nile direction Atbara. The road is good and we are making rapid progress. We look out for a coffee woman. We want some breakfast. In Atbara there is nothing to see. It is a transportation not for the rail, a typical city with low houses and bustling activity. We do without a visit and stay at the roadside stand at the coffee woman. We learn that the lady is not Sudanese, but an Ethiopian, probably a Somali. Since the war, many Somalis are living in Sudan, especially in the capital Khartoum. The coffee preparation is interesting. Not only coffee, but also spices are mixed into the coffee. Each woman has her own coffee recipe and the drink tastes delicious. After this break we go to the Meroe pyramids, good asphalt road, and we make it to the late afternoon to the pyramids. We turn from asphalt towards the campsite and again we are stuck in the sand. Now air must be released to about 1.5 bar to move forward again. Sand ladders will not be needed. Tara feels hot. She is bored and doubts in my car driving skills. It does not help. Now we are waiting in the sweltering heat until all the tires are ready. The scenery all around us is spectacular, like a picture book, lonely and abandoned. Not quite as lonely. Camel riders are approaching from the distance. No. Assalamu alaikum. Tara cannot stand this and barks at the strangers. Her job is to guard the car after all. Mia. 
We do not know what the riders want from us, language barriers, but it quickly becomes clear they want to take Alexandra for a ride in the desert. The camel protests. It would rather lie in the shade, but it does no good on its feet and off they go. And before I realized what happened, my wife has gone already. I cannot worry about that now. I must release air from the tires to get the car go again. After a while, Alexandra is brought back. She liked it well. No one asked me. Now we can start again. The pyramids of Meroe are located in a beautiful landscape. They are the main attraction in the Sudan in cultural terms. Even so, you feel nothing of tourism here, for it is still in its infancy. The pyramids stand alone on a hill like a row of broken teeth, an interesting sight. Though the pyramids were clearly influenced by the Egyptian counterparts, they are however very different in shape and size to those at Giza. The largest of the pyramids of Meroe is under 30 meters with an angle of 70 degrees. The smaller size allows for quicker construction time and fewer workers, including the technical costs were less. The grave chambers were directly cut into the rock and the pyramids just built on top of it, a substantial difference to those in Egypt. The pyramids were covered with a clay plaster, giving them a smooth, shiny surface. The base was simply painted in red, yellow and blue stars. Unfortunately, all were beheaded, which is due to the work of an Italian treasure hunter. We cast a last glance at the magnificent scenery before we torture our vehicles through deep sand to the campsite. The difficulty is to find the right track. We can see the campsite in the distance and head towards it. Sections with firmer sand alternate with soft sand. One must realize in time when it is soft, so you have enough momentum on the one hand, on the other hand enough torque in reserve. Despite the 125 horsepower, the engine works heavily. However, we are also quite loaded with diesel and water reserve, 
an additional weight of about 150 kilograms. Finally we did it without getting stuck. <laughs> now we are at the campsite and have a fantastic view of the desert. In the distance one can again see the Maroa pyramids. No wonder why the rulers have chosen this place as a final resting place. We were lucky again and found a great place to stay overlooking the pyramids. We enjoy the rest of the afternoon with a bottle of cold beer. Tara is also satisfied. She can easily explore the area and enjoy her evening walk. In the afternoon, the next day we are already in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. Video. Khartoum was founded on the confluence of the White and Blue Nile and actually consists of three parts. The historic center, Omdurman, the old capital of Mahdi and the modern Khartoum North. The strategic importance of the confluence of the Blue and White Nile for the first time recognized by Muhammad Ali in his expedition to the Sudan in 1820. The original main market in the region was then transferred from Shendi to Khartoum and a garrison was established here, which eventually became a permanent settlement. Prior to that time it was not more than a fishing village. Only ten years after the expedition, Khartoum grew enormously. The city experienced a boom from 1850 as the Nile was released for the ships into the south and the city became the main transit point for ivory and slaves. The pressure of the Europeans in Khartoum led to the closure of the slave market in 1854. Thus the Nile became less important for Khartoum. A good view of the confluence of the Nile is from the Morgan family park. Good to see also the unusual hotel Burj Al Fateh, built in the form of a sail. We hear it should belong to the Libyan leader Gaddafi, or he should at least be involved by funding. At the campsite we meet the taxi driver Hassan. He will show us Khartoum the next day. 
Her son is fluent in German. He tells us that he had worked for years in Germany as a truck driver, but the homesickness drew him back to Sudan. From the savings he bought that car that is by now 25 years old, with which he earns a living as a taxi driver. With him, we drive to Omdurman to the dump of the Magdi. Just five months after his victory over Khadum, the Magdi died after a brief illness in 1885. The town with a silver dome was built to honor him. It became a real pilgrimage for all Sudanese, which replaces the pilgrimage to Mecca. After the British had recaptured Khadum, they blew up the monument in the air to destroy the pilgrimage. The nephew of General Gordon did the job and scattered the ashes of the Mahdi in the Nile. Lord Kitchener wanted the head of the Mahdi as a pencil stand. However, took distance from this, now the head is buried in Wadi Halfa. An exact replica of the dump was built in 1947 again. The dump can be entered by non-Muslims, but women must cover their hair. Hassan drives us to the souk of Omdurman. He is waiting in the taxi. The souk is the largest in the Sudan. The main section consists of many narrow streets with shops and stalls. The buildings are very old, but the sounds, the smell and the different dialects make up the charm of the souk. We stroll relaxed through the streets as Khadum is regarded as the safest capital in Africa. The people are very friendly here. They of course want to sell something. On a corner shows are offered at a different corner spices. All this is available in the soup. There are not only crowds of people in the bazaar, but also traffic jam. Motor rickshaws fight with cars to the right of way. A really lively mess. With Hassan's taxi, we torture ourselves out through heavy traffic to the periphery where there should be a camel market. The traffic is unusual by Western standards and we are glad that we have left our car in the Blue Nile Sailing Club by our campsite. The camel market does not meet our expectations. It is said to be the largest in Sudan, but we see only a handful of animals. The province of Darfur is the center of camel breeding in the Sudan, and most of the animals that are offered for sale comes from this region. Most camels are destined for the Egyptian market as meat suppliers. A small portion is delivered to the Gulf states as racing camels. We talk to a group of traders. Hassan translates. Of course, we are an attraction here. When do Europeans come to the camel market? Our women are naturally admired. Timid, cautious approach to a foreign culture. <laughs> Proudly they show us the animals. Normally you have to pay the bride price for marriage in camels, but we do not get an offer. 
We do not know whether these animals have already been sold or whether a buyer is sought. The cameras like the fresh green grass. We take photos and they want money, for food of course. We make a donation and leave. I once again want to know it and decide to have my hair cut. Hassan brings us to the hairdresser. A few minutes later I regret my decision, but now there is no escape. And the barber already comes to the point. I wanted as usual hair washing and cutting, but seemingly washing is not done here. Hassan and Bain are amused and curiously observe what is happening here with me. So far, everything still seems to happen normally. With an electric shaver, the hair is cut, not measured, but by feeling. I discover another customer. I really do not want to look like him, but about the style of the hair, we have not previously spoken. I sincerely hope that the barber had ever foreign customers, although unlikely because the store is outside the city center. The thing takes shape, seems to be not so bad. Then it gets really bad. With a shiny razor blade, the edges of the hair are trimmed. I'm afraid. Can he handle the blade? Will he cut inside me? How many times he has already used this blade? There are many diseases in Africa. I try to keep still and not flinch. Through the mirror, I see a different client. He receives the default hairstyle. All hair cut to boldness. With this style they have experience, but with my hair... Suddenly, I get some substance smeared into my face. What is this? A face peeling? I did not order. Could be expensive. I count our cash holdings in the head. Now it must rest for a while. Then the procedure is repeated. I sit helplessly in the chair and have to wait. Then all the stuff is rubbed off my face like a scratch card. Does not feel so bad. I am envied by Bain and Alexandra. Hassan remains skeptical. Now I get another substance into my face. The hairdresser massages and rubs pretty wild. Where I am gone. Only now is the turn of hair washing and the substance is washed from my face, a strange approach. Still rubbed dry and finished is the whole bag of tricks. I'm not sure if I should laugh or cry. All the others laugh, so I do the same and take the result on the bright side. Pay about 5 euros and it is good. Freshly styled, we go to the dance of the dervishes. The ceremony has already started. A preacher speaks to people and is waiting for the approval of the crowd. The whole takes place in Omdurman at the tomb of Sheikh Hamid al Nal, a Sufi leader of the 19th century. Every Friday afternoon, members of the Sufis meet to hold the religious ceremony. Around the preacher, already some men started to prepare for the ritual. They sing and beat the drum.
centigrade, a great square was created for the dancers. The sun starts slowly and increased gradually. to receive the name of God and with his assistance to fall to an ecstatic state in which the heart can communicate directly with God. <laughs> Then there is a short pause and the Sufi form up to march to the grave. Once the green flag is raised, the actual retail starts. While they march, they sing continually, La illa la illa la, which translated means, there is no God but Allah. It is the first line of the Muslim Facebook. Waited on the edge, join. Safis are often described as dancing dervishes, which is actually a misnomer, for the ritual consists mainly of marching in a circle, sing and clap their hands. Only occasionally, individual Safis break out, turn around their own axes in a trance to find a personal path to God. The central idea of Sufism is to find a personal path to God, which differs fundamentally from the orthodox Muslim prayer ritual. The Sufis organize themselves in order or brotherhoods, headed by a charismatic leader or sheikh. Sudan is one which was founded in the 12th century in Baghdad and taken from there to the Sudan. Thank you. 
the retail reaches its peak to be recognized by the increasingly loud chants and movements become faster and faster. the Sufis in their religious ceremony. Tomorrow we will leave Khartoum and head towards the Ethiopian border.